Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, those of you who don't know me, which I, I guess is quite a lot of you, um, my name is Simon Plant. I'm with the university here, and also with the IMT <coughs> Lancashire and Cumbria Local Network. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's lecture, which is part of a tour organised by the local networks of the Institution of Engineering and Technology. You've probably seen enough uh, promotion of the IMT on the screen behind. So I'll tell you no more about the IMT. But I do have a few housekeeping announcements to make. I'm going to have a small list. Firstly, please remember to turn off your mobile phones. I turn mine off. <coughs> please refrain from flash photography. No one should ever use flash. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you do need the toilets that are in the foyer, we've been in the foyer coming to you before, coming in through here. Um, if there's a fire alarm, exit is also through the foyer. And if you could please at the end of the talk, <coughs> or rather at the end of questions, because Richard will take questions at the end of the talk. If you could take any cups and, and glasses that you may have back through to the foyer to help. And pretend that we didn't have any food or drink in this room. <laughs> Before I introduce Richard, I, I have a list of thanks to various people and organisations that have helped make this lecture tour possible. They are the Free Software Foundation, the British Computer Society, North West Linux and of course the University of Central Manchester where we are. Um, I'd also like to thank the individuals who have been helpful in spreading the word about this lecture through various social media sites. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce and to welcome Dr Richard Stallman. He's an inspirational figure to many and an individual who has already achieved much when it comes to sharing and advancing knowledge enhancing the lives of many people around the world in the process. For the benefit of those few of you probably who um, may be new to the free software movement, Richard launched the development of the new operating system in 1984. It was free software, everyone has the freedom to copy it and redistribute it as well as make changes either large or small. And that, is that the GNU? This is an adorable GNU. GNU. An adorable GNU. Um, that needs a home. <laughs> and I hope it will get a, find a home at the end of this talk. I'm sure it will. <laughs> <laughs> um, many of you will also be familiar with the GNU Linux operating system, which is a combination of the GNU operating system with Linux added which is used on tens of millions of computers today. Um, topically, I am myself at the moment in the process of installing a GNU oh, Linux system. But Richard has um, received the ACM Grace Hopper Award, <laughs> a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. Is, is there an action for the no, MacArthur? No, I'm not. <laughs> Suggestions for actions for the MacArthur uh, Foundation Fellowship, I'm sure we'll be grateful we receive. Maybe you need a landing ship for that or something. Uh, <laughs> might be tricky. Um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation's Pioneer Award and the Takeda Award for Social and Economic Betterment and several honorary doctorates. I should say it's much better to get the Pioneer Award than to get the Pie in Face Award that Mr. Bill received at about the same time. <laughs> the title of Richard's speech tonight is A Free Digital Society. Question. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Richard Stone. There are many projects aimed at extending digital inclusion, trying to close the digital divide. And what those projects take for granted is using 
computers and the internet is good and not to use them is bad. Well, that might be so, but not necessarily. A digital society can be good or bad. It's only good if it respects our freedom. So this talk is about many issues of freedom that are created by use of computers and the internet or else exacerbated by them or have a new opportunity to attack us because of computers and the internet. What do we have to do to make sure that digital inclusion is a good thing? The problems I want to talk about are surveillance, censorship, restrictive data formats, user subjugating software, services that take away control of your computing, services that uh, abuse your data, and the war on sharing, and the fact that internet users in general have no right to do whatever they're doing. <clears throat> Surveillance existed before computers, but computers are Stalin's dream. Computers make it possible to keep track of everything everyone does in a way that even Stalin couldn't afford to do. <clears throat> so, for instance, we find that the European Union requires ISPs to surveil their users and keep records for a substantial period of time after the user's activity. Telephone systems today keep track of every phone call so they know who talks to whom, which is information of tremendous use to any authoritarian regime. <clears throat> the UK is perhaps the world capital of surveillance. In the UK, all car travel is monitored by the state. The automatic cameras connected to computers that recognize car license plates, simply record everywhere everyone goes on the roads. This, of course, should be utterly outrageous. Paving the way for this was a scheme to tax drivers in London. Well, whether that's good or bad pales by comparison to the surveillance that it introduced. But when people debated that question, they didn't pay much attention to its relationship to freedom. That was almost forgotten compared with questions of how much would anyone have to pay? Well, I'd pay to have my freedom. I'd pay not to be spied on. <clears throat> now, if we could be confident that the police would only use this information for valid, just reasons, it might be okay. But you can never trust police to do that. And especially not in the UK. When you consider what uh, Officer Kennedy did and how they were going to put protesters on trial while they had recordings that he made proving that they were innocent and they were going to keep all that secret in order to carry out a miscarriage of justice. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> in and we also know that one of the main purposes for which the police are used is to sabotage political activity. And surveillance is used for that also. The surveillance of car travel was used by Blyer to sabotage a, a demonstration by arresting the people before they could get there. So we don't have to speculate that this surveillance is used to attack your rights. 
It's already used that way. And the only solution is to make it impossible for them to do that. Now, a free society can't guarantee that you can go everywhere unobserved because other people are using the street also and they might see you and remember you. They might occasionally take a picture which you might be in. They have a right to do that also. But there's a big difference between the occasional haphazard memories of lots of people and systematic, organized, centralized surveillance information. Because the former is diffuse. To collect it is enough work that they won't do it unless it's very important. And that limits the extent to which you could be monitored. But centralized computer-operated surveillance can collect information on everybody and put it in a form that's convenient for the police to use for any purpose. So it's a different order of danger. And we shouldn't let the fact that people have always been able to notice you when you walk down the street lead you to accept a completely different order of surveillance in society. <clears throat> Another danger to freedom in the digital society is censorship. And censorship is not limited to tyrannical regimes such as the former one in Tunisia and the current one in China and Iran. You find it in many European countries. Someone was recently sentenced to prison in France for expressing an opinion. That's tyranny. People have been sentenced to prison, or I don't know if they were, maybe they were just, I read they were being, going to be tried. I guess that there hasn't been an outcome yet. It was a few months ago in the UK, someone was arrested and charged for burning a Koran and posting a video of it. Well, that's expressing an opinion. We don't have to agree with his opinion or even judge it at all to recognize that his right to express that opinion must be defended. <clears throat> so censorship, of course, exists without computers and it's dangerous without computers, but once we have the internet, censorship can occur there too. Many European countries already have imposed filtering on the internet. They include Denmark, Italy, France, I think. I believe France now has a law allowing websites to be shut without a trial. And Spain recently passed one too. <clears throat> so this is a form of censorship where there is no need even to put some, no need even to charge someone before censoring him. China used to carry out censorship by basically cutting people in China off from the rest of the world. And that was pretty effective as censorship, but it had many negative effects on China, which the leaders didn't like either. So now they have a more, they have a, they have a system of censorship which is not totally airtight, but which mostly succeeds in keeping most people in China in the dark about what's happening in their country by stopping them from getting information from outside and causing that information to be hardly noticeable compared with the regime's own information. We've also seen that as a last resort, regimes will shut off the internet completely if they think that too much information is getting through. But most of the time they succeed 
in keeping the number of people who get the information small enough that they aren't enough to take any significant action based on it. That's the case in China. Information leaks in. Some people in China have access to news published from outside, but most of them don't see it. So the system effectively functions to support tyranny, even though it has some leaks. <clears throat> <clears throat> of course, censorship typically, censorship in the internet tends to be backed up by other kinds of censorship. In the UK, people have faced charges because of documents that they read. Now, censorship always has an excuse. Uh, at a conference a few years ago, a representative of the international organization of uh, basically record companies said, we love child pornography because child pornography gives us an opportunity to institute censorship of the net and once the filters are in place, it's easy to extend them to some other purpose. The censorship rules are typically secret. The list of sites that are censored is secret. The list of sites censored by Denmark was leaked and posted on WikiLeaks. That page is also blocked. And not only that, it's on Australia's censorship list. Australia has been talking for years about imposing filtering on the net, but it has been blocked as far as I know. However, it does have censorship of links. And Electronic Frontier Australia was sentenced to a fine of $11,000 a day if it didn't delete a link to a foreign political website. That website was deemed to have photos that were disgusting. Uh, I think they were photos of fetuses because it was an anti-abortion website and wanted to gross people out. Well, I disagree completely with their political point of view, but that is no reason for me to endorse censorship of them or anybody. <clears throat> so you never know how far they're going to go. It's, it can even be hard to find out how far they've gone. The next point I wanted to mention is that of data formats that restrict users. Most of the time, the distribution of audio and video on the internet is done with formats that restrict the users. There are two ways that this can happen. One is if the format is secret, and the other is if the format is patented. Secret formats are used quite a bit. The best expert I know told me that the site Hulu.com transmits its video in a format he can't identify. And obviously expects it to be decoded with a proprietary program in the user's computer. Italian public television distributes in a secret format uh, called VC1, I believe, which was developed by a standards committee that didn't publish it. It offers to rent you a machine-readable copy, but you'd have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And this is supported by Microsoft Silverlight. That's mostly, I believe, what Silverlight is used for, uh, for these <coughs> broadcasts in secret formats. 
Now, the idea of a secret standard for communication is offensively absurd. And for a public agency to communicate, communicate that way is a clear indication that that state has betrayed the public it's supposed to serve. Now, there is a free supposed replacement for moonlight, but it's no use, sorry, for silver light, it's called moonlight. And as far as it goes, it might be okay, but it's useless for this purpose because you'd have to run a non-free program on top of it to view the broadcast. Now, sometimes the formats are not secret, but they're patented. That means distributors of software to handle those formats can get sued. And as a result, companies typically don't take the risk. Once they see somebody's people are actually getting threatened, they don't take the risk. And that's the case with MP3 format. MP3 is not secret, but developers of MP3 software that, that is free have been threatened. The patent belongs, I believe, to Thompson. So you can hold Thompson responsible for this outrage. So for this reason, I refuse to let people post the recordings of my speeches in MP3 format. I tell them, use Og Vorbis format, which is not patented. For video, MPEG-2 and MPEG-4 are both covered by patents, lots of them. Uh, free software does circulate to handle them and MP3, but still, by distributing anything in those formats, you're putting other people in some danger. So you shouldn't do it. You should always use other formats. For video, we have Og Theora and we have WebM. However, we can't be sure that there are no patents to attack them with and people are trying to look for patents to attack them with. So we may not be safe at all. <clears throat> so, we also have to look at the example of Flash as a format for video. Except that, well, and Flash is mostly supported by a proprietary program with known malicious features for surveillance and restriction of the user. So, nobody should install Adobe's Flash Player, and you shouldn't put Flash in any website because by doing so you're pressuring people to use that malicious program. But there, is, there are some free Flash Players, but they're incomplete. So in practice, the use of Flash tends to push people to run the non-free program, and thus we have to consider it a a format that restricts the user. <clears throat> now, there have been other formats developed to restrict the user, not for audio and video. Many applications store the user's own data in a secret format so that they can't use their own data as they wish. The next threat to our freedom is from software that the users do not control. In other words, non-free software. With software, there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the program controls the users. For the users to control the program, they need to have sufficient freedom in what they do with it. And this we call free software. 
so that it's free as in freedom, not, not as in price. And the definition of free software is in terms of which freedoms you have. There are four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. And there are proprietary programs whose licenses don't even allow people to run their copies as they wish. And these programs frequently have total contempt for private property because the developers say that you're not even allowed to own a copy. Everything is theirs. That's their idea of private property. Everything belongs to them. Uh, so that's freedom zero. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it so the program does your computing as you wish. This way, you decide what it's going to do instead of being forced to accept whatever decisions the developer imposes on you. When programs don't come with Freedom 1, they often have malicious features. I call them malicious because they're intentionally designed to do things that the users would resent if they knew. So these developers are not sincerely trying to make software that serves the users. The users are prey for them. And the program is designed to deliver that prey to some other purpose. And this is not a rare occurrence. In fact, it's the usual case for people using proprietary software. Most of them are, in fact, the victims of these malicious features. We have found malicious features to spy on the user, to restrict the user, and backdoors to attack the user in Microsoft Windows. Mac OS has digital handcuffs, fun functionalities to restrict the user. The newer Apple products are worse. In the iMoan and the iBed, Apple has seized power over the installation of applications. The users are not even free anymore to install whatever programs they like because Apple has extended its power. Apple is a pioneer in designing products to attack the user. And they have back doors which Apple can use to remotely delete applications, whether the user wants to or not. And then there's the Adobe Flash Player. And then another example is the Amazon Swindle. The Amazon Swindle is a product designed to swindle readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers. For instance, there's the freedom to acquire a book anonymously by paying cash. Not possible for most books that are officially in print for the swindle because the only place to get them is from Amazon and Amazon requires users to identify themselves. So Amazon has a long list of all the books that each user has acquired. Now this is obviously a threat to human rights, especially in a country where people can be imprisoned for what they read, such as this one. So we can't tolerate the existence of that list. Then there's the freedom to give, lend, or sell the book to someone else, which Amazon takes away using digital handcuffs. That is, features designed specifically to restrict what users do with the data in their own computers. Such features ought to be illegal, but instead, governments take the side of those companies against the people. They've actually made it illegal to break the handcuffs and illegal to tell anybody else how to break the handcuffs. <clears throat> and there's a back door that Amazon has used to remotely delete books. 
Amazon deleted thousands of copies of a particular book. And the book with which Amazon demonstrated the Orwellian nature of this product was 1984 by George Orwell. So this is a thoroughly Orwellian product. Its official name is the Kindle. Kindle means to start a fire. Evidently, the purpose of this product is to burn our books. So don't let it. Don't use it. But my point is that most of the people who use proprietary software are using programs we know have malicious features. It's not a rare occurrence, one of those many things that bad things that occasionally happens to somebody and it's impossible to completely get rid of bad things in life. No, this is normal oppression. Our system is badly designed because it tolerates these sort of nasty behaviors as the usual case. They're not even rare. They don't have to hide. Then there's freedom too, the freedom to help others, the freedom to redistribute exact copies of the program when you wish. This allows you to use the program and still be a good member of your community who cooperates with other people. If a program doesn't give you freedom too, then it threatens to put you in a moral dilemma as soon as your good friend asks for a copy. If you don't want to be in that dilemma, don't use such software. And then freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. With that freedom, if a group of users make an improved version of the program, they're free to publish it so that we can all install it and we don't have to write the same improvement over and over again, each one of us. And because of Freedom 3, the users that don't know how to program can get this modified version too. So all the users benefit from the freedom of free software. Every user knows how to exercise freedom zero and two, the freedom to run the program as you wish and to redistribute exact copies because these don't require any programming. Freedoms one and three, the freedom to study and change the source code and then optionally distribute copies of your version, these require programming and most users don't know how to do this directly. But when programmers do this and publish a modified version, then every user gets the benefit of these contributions to the community. And these freedoms also give us a defense against malicious features because with these freedoms, the users control the program. There are some users who know how to program and from time to time they read part of the source code because maybe they are curious or they want to add a feature or whatever but the result is that if there's a malicious feature, they have a chance to see it and then they can fix it and publish a modified version that isn't malicious, which means the users have a defense against malicious features. It's not perfect, it's not a guarantee, but it's a lot better than being defenseless and proprietary software users are defenseless when the developer chooses to put in malicious features. That's why malicious features are so common in proprietary software and so rare in free software. With re free software, the users who can program protect themselves when they see a reason to, and in the process, they protect all the other users of the same program. But with proprietary software, the developer controls the program and the program controls the users and this adds up to a system of unjust power for that developer over the users. And what else is such a, a one going to do? He obviously abuse the power that they shouldn't have in the first place. So that's the issue of free software. 
which is the first of these issues I started to work on, I developed the GNU system so that it would be possible to run a computer without proprietary software. If you have a proprietary operating system in your computer, your freedom's already gone. The developer of that operating system has power over you and what you do with that computer. So in order to escape from that power, we need a place to escape to. To say, just don't use computers, well, yes, that's a kind of escape, but it's not a very good one. What we want is to be able to keep our freedom and use computers, and having a free operating system makes that possible. I started the development of the GNU system in January 1984, and in 1992, it was completed when Mr. Torvalds freed his kernel, Linux. Linux filled the last gap in the GNU system, which was almost complete at the time. So since then, we have the GNU plus Linux system, which is basically GNU, but has Linux in it also. Please don't call that system Linux. It's not fair to us. Please give us equal mention by calling it GNU plus Linux. So the next issue I wanted to mention is software as a service. Software as a service is a new way to lose control over your computing. By letting somebody else do it for you in his server. What it means is that in instead of doing your own computing on the data you have by running a program in your computer, we're assuming the program's free, you then have control over what's being done. Instead, you send all that data to a server where programs unknown to you run and do some computing, and then they send you the result. Or they may even take action directly on your behalf. And since the computing is done by these programs you can't touch, you have no control over it. So it's the equivalent of running a proprietary program in that you have no control over what computing is done for you that way. But it's worse than that. Some proprietary programs have spyware features. For instance, uh, Microsoft Windows. And that means that there is code in them which occasionally sends some information about the use of the computer to somebody's server. With software as a service, the user has to send all the data to somebody's server in order to start using it. So there's no special code required to do that, but the result is the same. The server gets the user's data. And who knows what's going to happen then. But it's worse than that. Some proprietary programs have back doors that allow somebody remotely to send commands to do things to the user. Like the Amazon Swindle and Microsoft Windows. The back door in Windows is a general purpose, a universal back door because it allows Microsoft to forcibly change the software. Microsoft can install changes in any program in the computer without asking permission of the nominal owner of that computer. So in effect, once Microsoft has Windows running in that computer, Microsoft has owned that computer. So any malicious feature that's not in Windows today could be forcibly installed tomorrow. So that's what I mean by universal malware. It's not just specific limited malware, it's universally mal malware. Well, with software as a service, the user sends the data to a server where various programs the user can't touch or see do her computing and the server operator can install different programs at any time, which means the server operator has the same kind of power that Microsoft has through the back door in Windows. 
the power to change how the user's computing is done without asking, without giving the user any choice. So, software as a service is inherently the equivalent of using a proprietary program which is spyware and has a universal backdoor. So, don't do it. They will invite you to do it because it's convenient and if you don't think about what you're doing, you might fall for it. Fortunately, software as a service is still rather unusual. It's not a small thing in absolute terms, but it's a small minority of all the websites in the world. Most websites just publish data. Looking at that data is not doing your computing, it's getting information from somebody. Totally different kind of thing. So that's not software as a service. It's a different kind of service, namely giving you data. Search engines are the same kind of thing. Yes, you send a query, but the query is just a way of saying which part of their data you want to see. And then you look at their data. So, uh, that's not software as a service. There may be other things, that, that ways it could mistreat you, but that's another issue I'll come to in a few minutes. It's not software as a service, because it's not doing your computing. So if we, dis if we set aside these majority of all websites and we look at the minority that do non-trivial services, most of them are still not software as a service, because most of them are doing communication, perhaps sending messages to people, publishing things for you, which is what Twitter does. Uh, well, that's not doing your computing, that's not personally yours, it's between you and someone else. You couldn't do that inside your computer, not even theoretically. Or they may be collaborative projects which you participate in, but when you do that you're not doing your own computing, you're helping the project do its computing. So the appropriate thing is that the project should have control over how its computing is done, but there's no reason why you should have. So, and, and by the way, e-commerce is a kind of communication. So most of these services are not software as a service. That leaves a small fraction of the web as doing software as a service. Those are the things that have this problem. But they are significant and you might do them. For instance, there is Google Docs. Google Docs has two problems. First of all, it requires you to run, it requires the user, I shouldn't say you, uh, to run a large non-free program written in JavaScript. And second, it's doing the user's word processing for him. So it's software as a service. Word processing is something that most of us do on our own computers. We've had word processing programs for 30 years or so. You can do it on your own computer and then you can have control of your computing. So resist the invitation to give someone else the control over it. Another thing that network services can do is misuse your data. That's an issue that most that people are more aware of. For instance, Google and Facebook were recently criticized for being too ready to hand over users' data to the police. Now, if the police want to get your data that you have in your home, they have to get a warrant. But they don't have to get a warrant against you and give you any chance to contest it uh, if they want data from, about you from Facebook or Google. They have to give Facebook or Google some kind of warrant, but they don't complain, they just hand it over. They don't give you a chance to defend yourself. So, 
one, th one way that services can misuse your data is by handing it over to the police in situations where the police wouldn't be able to get it from you. One of the bad things about the, the Pat Riot Act in the US is that it requires businesses to secretly hand over commercial data about their dealings with you to the police when the police basically just ask and they can't even tell you that you're doing it. Librarians have protested because this applies to libraries too. Now, another thing that a service can do is just is lose or change your data. Now, of course, that could, that could happen by accident and nobody's perfect. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about intentionally doing so. Several years ago, I saw a, an article posted by a US lawyer who said that uh, AOL had lost his account, all his data disappeared, and eventually they admitted to him it wasn't an accident. The Bush regime had asked them to lose his data, and he didn't have another copy. He trusted them. Well, he shouldn't have trusted them, but that's no excuse for such malicious behavior. Then there's the kind of malice that Facebook is based on. Facebook's business model is to collect personal data and use it in ways that are somewhat abusive. Whatever they can get away with, they do. But they'll never stop entirely because this abuse is the basis for their business. For instance, I read in January that Facebook was selling ads using the faces of its users. The, that if a user said, I like this, then it would sell that company the use of that f user's face in ads. So these people were being roped into endorsing products and they, even, and they weren't even getting paid for it. Only Facebook was getting paid for it. So Facebook is not your friend. It's not software as a service because what it's doing is communication, not a user's own computing. But it can still mistreat the user in the use of that user's data. Another thing that Facebook tried for a while was to make users agree that Facebook could use any works that they uploaded for any purpose. So if people put their photos on Facebook, Facebook would then say, okay, thanks, we now have uh, uh, unlimited rights to use this photo. They eventually stopped that but they replace it with something else nasty. They'll always have something nasty to do with people's personal data because their business is based on that. <clears throat> Facebook itself is not software as a service because it's not doing the user's computing. But there are secondary services that run on top of Facebook and some of them might be software as a service. Each one of them is different it might be software as a service or it might not. <clears throat> the next threat to our freedom that I want to mention is the war on sharing. The war on sharing is the attempt to stop us from using the internet for what it is best at transmitting, copying data. <clears throat> the internet makes this easy. Some people don't want us to get that benefit of the internet. They are the companies that profit from restricting the use of published information. And for more than 10 years, they have been trying to attack people who use the internet 
for its most obvious purpose, to share copies of published works. And in doing so, they're willing to destroy basic ideas of justice, which they have no respect for. And we see over and over again governments catering to them against their own citizens. For instance, in the UK, you, have, you suffer under the Digital Economy Act, which was a flagrant betrayal of the citizens, which was passed in a hurry because they were desperate to betray the country before they were voted out of office. And this law threatens to punish people without a trial. Punishment without trial, that's obvious tyranny. But no tyranny is too much for them. <clears throat> then there are the other laws that are used to uh, stop this. Those are the laws that prohibit breaking digital handcuffs and prohibit distributing software that can break digital handcuffs. Many published media today use secret formats whose purpose is specifically to restrict the users. I was mentioning that before. Another example is most ebooks. This is how it is that the Amazon Swindle has digital handcuffs that can restrict the users because the ebooks are distributed in a secret format and the only software we're supposed to be allowed to have to look at that format is the non-free software released by Amazon for that purpose, specifically designed to restrict the user. So that's a technical restriction measure. It's a combination of the format which is secret, publishing works in that format, and designing non-free software to use that format but restrict the users in doing so. And you'll typically find this same constellation of elements in every such attempt to restrict the users. It depends fundamentally on non-free software because non-free software is software the users don't control. It takes away their freedom at that basic level. And the purpose of taking away the user's freedom with non-free software in this case is to take away their freedom in using the data in their computers. One attack on your freedom, making the software non-free so you don't control it, is the means for another attack on your freedom, which is restricting what you do with the data you've got. <clears throat> well, it turns out that that by itself doesn't always work because there are clever users who can figure out the format and develop some other software to access that same data and they can release that. So the record companies and movie companies and so on told their tame governments to crack down on people who do that with censorship. The US started this wave of censorship in 1998 by passing the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which imposed censorship on such software. But the European Union, which is very much a force for the empire of the megacorporations, followed suit and passed a directive in 2003, I believe, which was then implemented by nearly every country in Europe in a form nastier than the directive required. In France, the mere possession of a copy of a program to break digital handcuffs is a crime punished by imprisonment. 
There is one exception I know of. In Finland, a few years ago, a court ruled that the software, the free software to watch a movie on a DVD, DVDs are another example of a secret format, initially was secret, to restrict users with digital handcuffs. Well, the court in Finland ruled that that free software was so widespread that the, that this system no longer qualified as an effective technical restriction measure, so the law didn't apply to it, and that free software had become lawful. Well, if we could expect courts to do that in all these countries, maybe that law wouldn't have much effect. And if it ceased to have effect, I guess we could stop worrying about it. But I don't think we're likely to get that result. I think it's more likely that those same companies that profit by restricting computer users will order their puppet governments to pass additional nastier laws. If you have a portable tracking and surveillance device, please switch it off. <laughs> They already tracked you here. They already know that you've come to this speech. And if they want to listen to the speech, they don't need to do it by activating your surveillance device in eavesdropping mode, which many of them have, by the way, uh, because we're going to publish the recording. So they, they could listen to that. And in fact, they were welcome to come anyway. So you might as well switch it off. But if you want to be really sure it's not tracking you, you have to take the batteries out. <laughs> so <clears throat> the war on sharing takes many forms. You also see a lot of propaganda propaganda against sharing, trying to demonize this act of cooperation. For instance, there's the word pirate, which is meant to make us think that helping other people, cooperating, is the moral equivalent of attacking a ship. That metaphor was actually initially used by authors against publishers, but the publishers took it and used it to demonize the members of the public whom copyright is actually supposed to serve. Copyright is not supposed to be a privilege that authors deserve to be able to hand over to publishers because they're more important than everybody else. No, it was a system to promote authorship. Well, actually, before that, it was a system of censorship. But it was reformed under Queen Anne to a system to encourage authorship. And that goal is a valid goal as long as the means proposed are not oppressive. But nowadays, that goal is of no importance to anyone in government. It's an excuse and nothing more. The real goal is simply to maintain those companies' power over the users of these works. So please don't ever use a product designed to attack your freedom unless you personally have the means to defeat that attack. Don't accept any product with digital handcuffs unless you have the means to break the handcuffs. In addition, as various states begin <coughs> to threaten to punish people for sharing, you will find that they employ the tactic of collective responsibility, a favorite tactic of tyrants, where they say, you must help enforce these unjust laws against everybody else. If you fail to enforce them, we'll punish you. A sign of tyranny. 
So keep your Wi-Fi networks without passwords because they want to conscript you into putting on a password and thus acting as an enforcer against everyone else. They want to keep everyone frightened and divided. That's how tyranny works. So having an open Wi-Fi network is one form of resistance. <clears throat> the final issue is that Internet users don't have the right to do what they're doing. I'm not saying it's necessarily illegal. Not everything that we do on the Internet is illegal, but we don't have a positive right to be able to do it. If I want to speak to you, I can do it using my own mouth and throat. I don't need anybody to deign to give me the means to speak. If I want to write, well, I can buy a copier and I can even make printed copies and I can hand them out to you or sell them. And then I don't need anybody to deign to give me the chance to publish what I've written. But if I want to show you something on the internet, I need the cooperation of various organizations that have no legal obligation to give it to me. For instance, I need an ISP. I need uh, a domain which I have to get from a registrar. And I probably, for a server in today's conditions, need hosting somewhere. Any one of those organizations can be pressured to cut me off and there's nothing to stop them from cutting me off. They won't, most of them won't even hesitate to do so. If they're put under any pressure at all, it's just not worth it to them to resist. The easiest thing to do is to cut me off. This was brought force, forcefully home to us as we watched in December the Dirty Tricks campaign against WikiLeaks as the US government launched a cyber attack to disconnect WikiLeaks not only from the internet but also from payment because payment through the internet is similarly precarious. If I want to give you some cash I don't need anyone else to permit me to do so. I can just give it to you. But to use a credit card, we would both need the cooperation of various banks or other organizations. So PayPal said it would refuse to send money to WikiLeaks. And the Bank of America said it would refuse to send money to WikiLeaks. Now, this should be illegal. But as long as it's not, it means that all activity on the internet is vulnerable to pressure from anyone powerful enough who wants to make it stop. So if we want a free digital society, we have to make sure that no one's participation is vulnerable to these threats. Of course, that could be done by law in a country where the government follows laws. But what we see from this Dirty Tricks campaign is that we can't rely on that either. The US government is now regularly turning off domains without a trial, just as we have seen laws in other countries to do, but the US government controls the most important top level domains and is using this power helter skelter around the world to attack all sorts of victims. So 
some of these problems we can solve with free software. When the injustices perpetrated through our own software, through the software we're running, free software protects us. But that doesn't, that's not always the way it's done. For instance, if we don't want to be monitored by ISPs, we can't fix that by any change we make in our own computers. We have to do that by pressuring the ISPs or the state. And likewise, if we don't want to, the state to track everybody's driving, we can't do that by changing our own cars. So some of these issues can only be solved through collective political action, demanding freedom. That's my talk. Uh, I see there is actually a clock there. So now, before I answer questions, I would like to auction this adorable GNU that needs a home for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. Now, we can accept payment in cash or through credit cards, <laughs> but not the kind of card where a chip has to operate to make a payment. It has to be something you could use for a telephone order, because that's effectively what it's going to be. Uh, if you are the purchaser of the GNU, I can sign either the card or the side of the GNU. It's easier to see it on the card, but I'll do it either way you wish. If you have a penguin, you need a GNU. <laughs> because, as we all know, a penguin can't hardly do anything without a GNU, except talk on the, t on the phone. Uh, when you bid, please wave your arm and shout out the amount you're bidding because you want me to notice you. So I'm going to start at 15 pounds. Do I get 15 pounds? I've got 15 pounds. Please shout out the bid. Yeah, he's setting an example, you see. Do I get 20 pounds? I've got 15. Do I get 20? I've got 20. Do I get 25? I've got 25. Do I get 30? I've got 30, do I get 35? I've got 30, do I get 35? I've got 35, do I get 40? I've got 35, do I get 40? I've got 40, do I get 45? I've got 45, do I get 50? I've got, I've got 50, do I get 55? I've got 50 pounds, do I get 55? 55 pounds for this adorable GNU. I've got 55. Do I get 60? I've got 60. Do I get 65? Do I get 65 pounds for the Free Software Foundation to defend your freedom? I've got 60. Do I get 65? I've got 65. Do I get 70? I've got 65. Do I get 70? I've got 70. Do I get 75? I've got 70. Do I get 75? Do I get 75? I've got 75. Do I get 80? I've got 75. Do I get 80 pounds for this adorable canoe? I've got, I've got 80. Do I get 85? I've got 80. Do I get 85 pounds? 85 pounds for this adorable canoe that needs a home? Do I get 85 pounds for the Free Software Foundation to defend your freedom? Do I get 85 pounds? Do I get 85? Do I get 85? Last chance to bid 85. Going, going, go. I've got 85. I've got 85. Do I get 90? I've got 90. What? I couldn't hear you. Did you say 90 or? I've got 90. Do I get 95? I've got 90. Do I get 95? Do I get 95? I've got 90. Do I get 95 pounds for this adorable canoe? 
Do I get 95, 95 pounds to the Free Software Foundation? Do I get 95, last chance to bid 95 or more? Do I get 95, going, going, gone for 90? I should also mention that you can get more information about the Free Software Foundation at fsf.org. And you can also join and become a member. And you could also do that right here, paying cash if you want to. Uh, or even with a credit card right here if you want to. I've got cards you can fill out to do that. Uh, there's also the Free Software Foundation Europe at fsfe.org, which is a sister organization. And you can also join that. So now, questions. What's your view on the risks to freedom of um, cloud computing and software like Dropbox? Cloud computing is a vague, nebulous term. It's not clear what you're even talking about, so I don't use that term. We should talk about software as a service. Software as a service is a much more specific thing. You see, cloud computing, as people use that term, includes software as a service and lots of other things, too. And these things raise different issues. So there's nothing useful you can say about cloud computing. So you shouldn't formulate your thoughts in that term. If you want to say something sensible... What about something specific like Dropbox? Now, I've never used that. As far as I know, that's a place where one person can upload a file and say that someone else can get it. Is that right? I don't see much harm in that. Uh, it would be better if you encrypted the data before you uploaded it. Then the worst they could do would be to fail to transmit it. Are you uh, optimistic or pessimistic about the, the future of the... I am generally pessimistic. <laughs> but so what? The point is, we should fight for our freedom rather than just give up without a fight. Um, you talked about censorship. What's your views on schools censoring what they consider harmful sites for children? Well... I'm not sure so much about that. That's not, that's not censorship imposed on the whole society. And on the other hand, keeping kids in the dark about sex, for instance, is not good for them. And uh, so I can see how that can be harmful as well as offensive to those kids. So I think it would be better for them just to warn instead of block. This site, we think you might find this site so gross that you would get disgusted and it might bother you for a while. So you might be happier if you don't look. Uh, you were on about uh, software as a service before, and um, it is handy to have software as a service and depending on the functionality it has. But I can't hear all the words you are service. saying. But you are on about software as a service before. I what about software? You was on about software. Ah, uh, okay, that's a, an expression I don't know. <laughs> I criticised it. Yes. Well, what about software as a service where the server code is open source? I'm not a supporter of open source. Well, well, Never was. Kind of, uh, anyone can see the source. Okay. Well, that's actually not the definition of open source. Open source is a way of talking about free software while hushing up the ethical ideals of the free software movement. So I refuse to use the term open source because I started the free software movement because I care about these ethical ideals. I don't want them to be hushed up. So for that reason, I won't accept open source as a replacement for free software. Now, but the, other, the next thing to realize is 
the term open source is usually misunderstood even in a practical sense. Many people see that term and think it means what it would naturally mean, namely software that allows you to look at the source code. That's not the official definition. The official definition is pretty close to the definition of free software. Not exactly equivalent, but almost equivalent. But people see those words and they see the natural meaning, which is a much weaker criterion. And that misunderstanding hurts our cause even more. So if you care at all about freedom, please use the term free or libre software and not open source. Although, of course, I can't tell you what your views should be, but I, I, won't, I won't respond. If you start a discussion in terms of open source, I will not continue it in those terms. In any case, this, if, you, if you look at a server that does software as a service, the software in that server might be free or it might be proprietary. If it's free, then the server operator controls what's going on in his own server. That doesn't help the users of the service, though. That doesn't give them any control over their computing if they do it with the service. If the software is proprietary, that means the server operator doesn't fully control the computing in his own server because some software developer has control over it partly. Well, that's bad for the server operator, but two wrongs don't make a right. It doesn't help the users. So the problem of software as a service is independent of whether the software in the server is free. That makes a difference for the server operator. If it's proprietary, that's a further injustice to the server operator, which does no good for the users. What if the user could uh, put the data on the, on the server using this software, but in, they could encrypt it in whatever format they like? So well, if you transmit it encrypted, then basically the software on the server won't be able to do any non-trivial computing with it. All it could do is serve as a warehouse, in which case it's not doing your computing. It's a different kind of thing. It's a remote backup storage. Well, that's a totally different issue. There, the service doesn't consist of doing your computing. It's a different kind of service. And I guess it's OK. If you encrypt your data and you save it somewhere, the worst they can do is lose it. But you, know, you could have another copy. And of course, multiple copies is the way you prevent your data from being lost. So I think that's just fine. As, as long as people understand it's another place they can put their data so it won't be lost. Um, you, were, you mentioned that we should be uh, asking our ISPs and various other uh, governments to not censor the internet. Uh, do projects like Tor and Freenet not provide a technical Sorry, solution? Sorry, projects like what? Uh, Freenet and Tor uh, provide a technical solution for filtering. Well, Tor is. Tor does some th is basically is more intended to prevent surveillance. Whether it's of any use against filtering, I don't know. Uh, I suppose if the Tor network routes your web request to a different country which doesn't have the filtering on that page, then it might help you against filtering too. But an easier way to deal with the filtering is to have a VPN to some server, to some machine in another country, which, do, which you know ha doesn't have filtering. And maybe if you want the anonymity of Tor, you could also make it a Tor request from there. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't actually use these things myself. Well, my question was more about the not that, as well as political solutions, uh, technical solutions to these problems that we could be investigating. Well, to some extent, uh, you can get around the surveillance of your country by using a VPN to some other country. Uh, okay, I'm uh, starting out with a uh, software. I can't hear the sounds you say. 
please speak more carefully. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'm starting out as a software developer. I couldn't hear, but I think it was, I think it was your name, oh, Simon something. I am a software developer. I'm okay. starting out as a uh, software developer. Now, how do I um, balance out? Uh, as a balance house? out, I don't understand. How do I, how do I uh, Are you balance? on a scale? <laughs> I, Are you putting I, on weight lately? <laughs> no, well, okay. Uh, how do I make a living as a freelance software developer and keep the uh, try and keep some of the, uh, the values that uh, are oh, free? Oh well, things? sometimes you can do it and sometimes you can't. And when you can't, well, you should never develop proprietary software, so you might have to look for some other kind of job. But do keep in mind that most jobs in the computing, in the IT sector, are not software development. And most software development work is not proprietary software products, it's custom software. So the jobs that uh, I'm saying are doing something evil and that, they shouldn't, that shouldn't be done is really a tiny fraction of all the jobs in the IT sector. So even if those jobs disappeared, it would not be a big difference. The custom software development, which is much more, that would be basically the same if the software were free. Because the clients that are paying it for it to be written, they'd still have to pay for it to be written. Uh, there are many volunteers in the free software community, but they're not interested in writing specialized software for a particular business to use. So if the company asked them to write it, they would say, I'm not interested in that project, so I'll only do it if you pay me. And they're going to have to pay somebody. So proprietary software is not crucial to that business, and that's most paid software development. You uh, touched earlier on the record companies, the music industry, and the problems that they're having. What do you suggest as a way forward for them from this point? As a way to what them? I couldn't hear a word there. As, what do I suggest as a way to what them? Uh, you touched earlier on the music industry and the yes. film industry. Yeah. What do you see as a way forward for them? How to embrace A way forward them? for them? Yeah. Well, I don't think they're going to. I think we have to defeat them. And remember that one of the things that these companies have done in the war on sharing is suing teenagers for hundreds of thousands of dollars. What those companies deserve is to be destroyed. I, I'm, I'm thinking here perhaps of uh, Mike Masnick and his um, uh, Connect with Fans and Reasons to Buy. So I don't know who that person is. I couldn't really hear it. You said Mike Resnick, but I... Who? Mike Masnick. Masnick. I don't know who that is. I'm sorry. Okay. And you said, and his, and then I couldn't hear what you said. He's uh, Connect With Fans and Reasons to Buy, whereby the... Uh, oh, well, ah, that's for artists. That's different. The artists can sell lots of things to their fans. I also have two other recommendations for how to support artists, because I think supporting artists is useful. One is we could use tax money to support artists, either general revenue tax money or a specific tax, perhaps on internet connectivity. It could be a monthly flat fee. The point is how do you distribute this money so that it's effective for supporting the arts? Here's how I propose. You measure various artists' popularity by some kind of polling, which does not attempt to track everybody. It allows those who wish to participate to show what they're looking at from the artists that are known and in this system. And then, having measured their popularity, you take the cube root of the popularity of each artist and you distribute the money in proportion to their cube root popularity. 
I'm not saying this is the one and only perfect right function. It's an example. Cube root looks like this, basically. Uh, suppose superstar A is a thousand times as popular as fairly successful artist B. Well, if you distribute the money in linear proportion, A will get a thousand times as much as B, which means that either we have to make a, tremendously rich, which is wasting taxpayers' money, or we don't pay B enough, which means the system's not effective. If we use the cube root, A will get 10 times as much as B, which means that if we pay B enough to live on and not need a day job, we're not wasting so much money making superstars tremendously rich. They are getting more, but not astronomically more, right? So the result of this is that most of the money would go to supporting a large number of fairly successful, fairly popular artists. And a small fraction would be divided among the few superstars, and they would get to be well off, but not rich. And that's okay, because it wouldn't be a large fraction of the total amount of money. So this is one method. The other method is through voluntary payments. Imagine if each player had a button you could push to send maybe half a pound to the artists. The amount of money would be adjusted for each country. I'm thinking maybe half a pound would be a good amount for the UK but you might have a different recommendation. In the US, I'd recommend $1. And in most European countries, one euro would be a reasonable amount, but maybe some would make it different. In any case, the point is this money would go anonymously to the artists that made a certain work whichever work was the last one played or the one currently being played. And you could send this when you want, and you're not forced to, nothing bad happens to you if you don't, but why wouldn't you? It's a small amount of money and you'd feel good when you send it. Leaving so soon? <laughs> you mentioned about um, well, you, you, when you uh, accept free software under the GPL, one of the freedoms that's given to us is the ability to use that software for any purpose you wish. That, I have no argument with that, I agree with that. But what you're saying with software as a service is that when we um, choose to provide our data to these software as a service providers, um, we must mandate that they accept that under a license that means that they can't well, use I'm it. I'm sorry, service. I didn't say anything about that. What I said is don't use software as a service. No, you're saying that um, the software as a service providers, for example, you were saying about Facebook selling pictures of people. Oh, no, but no, 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 you've misheard. Facebook in general is not software as a service because what it's doing is not your computing. Facebook is doing communication. That's not software as a service, but it's bad because it's misusing personal data of the well, user. If we've chosen to provide our data to them, yes. should they not have the same freedoms as we have for providing Well, them? ah, no, no. Remember, what I was talking about was freedom in the use of software. Now, your photo is not a program, unless you have employed steganography to hide a program in it. Uh, these are different kinds of issues. Uh, first of all, I'm talking mainly about published software. It's true that not all software is published, but mostly the software we use is published. Now, your photo you might not publish, or you could publish it. Okay, if your photo could be published too, but then there's still a big difference between your photo and a program. The program is a work that does a job. 
and a photo is not. A photo is a work that one looks at. These are different kinds of contribution to society. When we use a work to do a job, when, it's a, when the nature of that work is it does a practical job, then the users are entitled to have control over that work so they can control the job they're doing. But when a work is just to be seen, appreciated, that's not a functional work. It's a different kind of work. In that case, it's more of a work of witnessing. Some photos are artistic works, some are just witnessing works. But neither of those is a functional work that does a job. <clears throat> it may be useful for some job, but it doesn't do a job. It doesn't control the job. In so, your case, do you advocate um, copyrighting your photo, for example? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear most of that, but I wasn't finished. <laughs> I, I could hear that you said something about copyright. I couldn't hear the other words. But in any case, copyright is a law, and laws should do what is right. So laws don't determine what's right, but they ought to be adjusted to fit what's right. So the question here is what's right, which is a deeper question than what any law says. I was, I was going to finish that. Okay. Um, if, would you advocate you um, copyright that photo with the intention of restricting the rights of the viewers to reproduce it, to talk about it? Well, I think that people are entitled to the freedom to non-commercially share copies of any published work. That is, non-commercially redistribute exact copies, which is sharing. That doesn't include commercial use, such as uh, for Facebook to sell some company an ad with your face in it. That's commercial use. And what I'm proposing doesn't give them commercial rights. And uh, in addition, uh, there's, you know, the, the right to use your photo in advertising is a separate issue even from commercial distribution of your photo. It could be, it, there's no reason we shouldn't have a separate law about using your image or your name in any advertising for the length of your life. Uh, and some places do have laws about that. So uh, those are separate issues. We don't have to treat them the same. But in any case, what to do with your photo is a different question from what to do with a program. Because a program is a functional work. Coming around to... I'm, I like free thoughts. In the practical world, we're in that my mother's an author. Um, your mother's a what? A writer. She's written several books, and which were printed in small numbers, not made any money from it. But um, at the moment, she's having somebody make them into e-books. What does that mean? What do you mean when you say make them into e-books? Are they going to be published with digital handcuffs? They will be, because that's the, what, what the people who are doing it. That's unethical. And no one should use those ebooks. She, she, what she's doing is joining up in the army that's attacking our freedom. And what she's going to get out of her participation in attacking our freedom is tiny. She's being foolish even in her own selfish terms. And yet the harm she's going to help be done to us is terrible. Now the thing is, balancing that against, if we just put out an unprotected book... Then people would share it and more people might read it. That would be horrible, right? <laughs> See, this is utterly foolish as well as evil. The converse of that is if people share it. My mother gets no return on... So what? 
How much money do you think she's going to get this way? This is this foolish dream of riches. I'm going to be the next tremendous success. It's like, I'm going to win the lottery. Well, you know something? Most of the people who think I'm going to win the lottery lose. She's almost certainly not going to get substantial money from e-books if she didn't get it from uh, printed books. And no one will read it except people who give up their freedom. So it's evil. I might conceivably buy one of her printed books. I will never buy an encrypted ebook. Never. I pledge this for the rest of my life. I will never buy one. And I hope every one of you will pledge the same. I'm, I'm, personally, I would agree with your stance on that. But then, if it's not encrypted, people that have been conned into buying a swindle won't be able to install it on their device. Sure, they, actually I believe they can. Yes, but that's not an important factor. There are times when we have the responsibility to set aside our, our own personal goals and do what is right for society. No one's desire to make money can justify promoting digital handcuffs. I see nothing wrong with the desire to make money as such, but this, there, after all, I don't believe that people should never be selfish. That's a selfish desire, but being selfish is not always bad. However, when the method of gaining your selfish desire is contributing to a, the establishment of a system of oppression, then it's wrong. And then you must not, you're not justified in trying to achieve your selfish desire that way. But, but Richard, if you and I have the freedom not to buy and use the Kindle, surely somebody else can have the freedom No, to just because people can say no to something does not mean it's ethical and does not mean that it's not an attack on people's freedom and does not mean we should let it go on. I propose that we should ban digital handcuffs. On the subject of digital handcuffs, uh, Richard, uh, I noticed when you set out your arguments, you never made the point. I know uh, I represent a minority in having uh, an impairment and freedom to uh, access um, software and to use it in a way that is accessible uh, means that some of the products, these digital handcuffs that these uh, dig new digital products produce, prevent people like myself accessing the media. The, uh, the e-books that my friend at the long bench here was talking about earlier, uh, it may be encrypted so that the, the author earns money, but then that prevents access to people such as myself. For many years, as uh, I think you know of the Emacs Speak uh, access solution, uh, has been the most affordable free access for visually impaired people. Uh, there's not just uh, speech access, obviously, there's other impairments of the disability movement that really need to work and, and push for the, the freedom, uh, access to software and modern technologies. Well, yes. Uh, people who have a special need and need to modify the software to do what they need can't do it when it's proprietary software. So one aspect of restricting the users from changing the program is they can't change the program to work with their disabilities. So I didn't mention that uh, partly because I didn't think of it and partly because I'm trying to save time, but also when something oppresses everyone, I don't want to focus on a minority who are oppressed like all the rest of us. Even if the oppression happens to fall on them harder, 
The point is, it falls on all of us. Focusing on the minority is often a mistake in choice of arguments because then the oppressor, or the oppressor can say, well, we'll make a special exception for the people in that minority. And then uh, our argument's taken away. I don't, I'm not going to campaign for Amazon to do something for blind people. I'm going to campaign against the oppression that they put into, that their products impose on every user. And the attack on society in general that happens when they restrict people from passing books among themselves. Uh, this is actually a slight response to you know, your man's mother over there. I can't tell what Sorry. words you are saying. <laughs> Sorry. This is more of a response really to the, the mother authors, the mother of the man there. I would like to say that freedom doesn't necessarily preclude making money. Um, I, for instance, there's a site called Web Subscriptions that provide non-digital handbook and coded books by many popular authors, and it's a full publishing house, and they charge money for it. And they succeed by providing provider the <laughs> service, which means I, I don't support the author, or I get books in very convenient ones that some of all the popular e-readers. So I would say freedom doesn't necessarily mean you can't make money out of books. There is a Canadian singer named Jane Sibbery, who was never a great star, but was somewhat known. In fact, I later realized I had heard one of her songs in the 90s, but I didn't know it was hers. Uh, I heard it on the radio. Uh, in any case, she has her music on a website, and she says, Download it and pay whatever amount you like. And it works. People pay. Not everyone, but a considerable fraction pay. And they often pay more than what the major record companies charge for downloading a track. So it's even possible that your mother might make more money if she sells copies and doesn't try to restrict sharing them. But that's a secondary argument because supposing that turned out not to be the case, it would not justify attacking sharing and it would not justify digital handcuffs. Those are simply evil. Um. Would you share my optimism that we could be on the verge of reaching a, a maturity where uh, digital freedoms could become an issue, perhaps a bit like organic food, where it becomes a popular issue that uh, people who aren't necessarily technically inclined can get their heads around and support? Well, I'm trying to make that happen. And if you also try to make that happen, if many of you do, we may succeed. I am a pessimist by nature, but giving up is useless. There's nothing to be achieved by giving up. Sorry, can I ask, can I ask you two questions? And I hope you understand my accent. My first question is this. You mentioned the lawyer in America that had his data deleted on websites like Gmail and Hotmail where we're invited to never delete your emails, etc., etc. Is there any evidence to your knowledge that those documents that are stored have been misused or abused by those companies? Well, I saw in a campaign by a U.S. NGO a few weeks ago, a week, maybe a week or two ago, to ask people to sign a petition to Google and, uh, and Facebook not to hand over data to the police so quickly, but to 
try to, to stand up for the legal rights of their own users. Now, I don't remember precisely what they said had occurred, but that certainly would be misuse. But also, I told you about lots of misuse that Google makes, sorry, sorry, that Facebook makes of users' data. Now, Gmail, I'm told, puts ads on the mail that users read uh, based on the words in the message. Now, that's not as bad, I guess, because you can just ignore the ads, which I do. Uh, one needs to learn a lot of sales resistance in our society. Uh, uh, so I guess I don't think that's as bad, but some people would say that is misuse. Yeah, I was thinking more of if they're giving access to government organizations to go snooping through mail and see what people... Well, are apparently that's, they, that's, that's what they're, they're doing. doing. Then I think that's very dangerous. And they're, they're doing so even though legally they could uh, resist. The second question I've got, all you said about electronic handcuffs. Could you please tell me which website I can download an electronic copy of your book and pay you as much as I think it's worth? Oh, well, all of the essays in my book can be found on GNU.org, as well as a postscript or PDF file of the whole book. And you can make a donation to the Free Software Foundation through fsf.org in any amount you wish. Thank you. Can I just um, come back again to software as a service? Do you think there are cases where it's okay if the no. service can't necessarily be done no. by the user? What if the user can't actually do that on his own and he needs an external? Well, I don't know. Why can't the user do that? But one could be he doesn't have the computing power, so... Well, I don't think that... You can have a computer. Computers are not that expensive. In India, more people have computers than have toilets. So what about in some kind of high-performance cluster where you want to do some scientific calculations or something? Well, that's a very special case where you're probably talking about institutions that have a relationship that isn't commercial. And that changes things somewhat. If, if they have a basis to work together, that's not like just using some business, uh, some, bus some commercial service. And the other thing is, that probably involves running your program on somebody else's computer, which is not software as a service. Okay, so, sorry, forget that example. What about the case, <laughs> where, what about the case where if um, I had some data and somebody else had data which I didn't have access to, but they kind of drew from their data and my data and created something which was of value to me? Well, that's being rather nasty on their part, I think. But they could, if they want to give you some kind of access to that data, they could let you search through it and so on, and find the stuff that's relevant, and then combine that with your, with your data. So, for, suppose there is a site for, with the census data, un, uh, unexpurgated, and they would let you run certain kinds of queries on that data and get the results, but they wouldn't give you information about any individual. Uh, that might be okay. It's not software as a service, because what you're doing is running your software on their machine, on their data. But uh, in any case, it might be okay, although it turns out that if you let people do that without restrictions, they can narrow in on individuals pretty easily, and uh, so you can't. By the way, I, on Stallman.org, my personal site, you can find a, a note with a link uh, explaining that the legal protections 
against misuse of UK census data have been basically gutted and you can't trust the UK census to maintain privacy of the information you give it and when they ask you for things like your political views and so on uh, you can't trust them with that. Uh, you've mentioned quite a lot about digital handcuffs, what other people would call digital rights management, which is a horrible term. Um, what do you feel about publishers that will give you an electronic copy of a book, but with a banner at the bottom saying, please don't give this to anyone else, but they don't put any technical measures well, to stop if they're not doing, if they're not using digital handcuffs, then it may be no different from a paper book. Basically, the three ways in which ebooks are typically legally worse, le worse in terms of your freedom, I guess I should say, not just legally, are worse than ordinary printed books are, first of all, you can't get them anonymously. Second, they tend to have digital restrictions management. And third, they tend to have contracts that restrict you in ways that printed books don't. So if they don't do those three things, it's no worse than a printed book. Now, I believe that people are, have a right to share published works, whether they're printed books or digital books or whatever. But that's a separate question. If they don't do these three things that make most e-books worse than printed books, then it's not worse than printed books. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Not very well. You need to pronounce your consonants more carefully. I couldn't hear any of that. Right. Um, I'm just switching. Um, you mentioned about uh, places where people are able, when the companies are able, people as pilots. I, I, I can't. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Maybe someone in, could, else could translate that to English? No, no, point is, if you say it to her and she could say it to me, then I could hear your question. Okay, so when you talk about piracy, and I people, don't. <laughs> and people label things as piracy, and you're saying it's wrong, uh, is there any time in which case it could be wrong? For example, when the mafia are using the funds for illegal trafficking, etc. Sorry, I couldn't follow the connection between the propaganda term piracy and mafia activities. I just don't follow that link. So if people copy films, um, there's a lot of different people that do it. For example, you have criminal groups that do it, but you also have children that do it. Obviously, the children, it's just... Well, this, these criminal groups, what exactly are they doing? What kind of activity are, are you talking about? You know, I suppose They'll that people in the the phone and then use the funds to fund their own activities. Well, how do they get funds by copying these films? I don't Selling them. So they sell them to people on the street. Yeah. What makes you think that those are mafia groups? <laughs> Some of them are. Who knows? Uh, maybe they. Maybe the people actually selling have to pay protection because it's illegal. So maybe the actual sellers are under the power of a mafia because selling those copies is illegal and maybe the police cooperate with the mafia, I, I'm sure they often do that. And so if the seller on the street doesn't pay a lot to the mafia, he'll get arrested. That sounds like the IRA, eh? 
Uh, I don't know that much about the IRA. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. A uh, one terrorist group or another. <laughs> so, uh, but <clears throat> I, I'm talking about the freedom to non-commercially share copies. So, if they're making money by copying these films, that's apparently a commercial activity. And I'm not talking about that. Um, hi. Um, what do you think about uh, hacktivist groups such as uh, Anonymous? So, they're actually trying to fight for internet freedom. But well, there's a point where... Anonymous does various different things. Uh, the protests that anonymous does where they just have lots of people tell their computers to send lots of requests to a website kind of like the script kid is of anonymous well the point is that that's comparable to a protest like the UK uncut protests and I think it's legitimate yeah. and what about the more technical side of anonymous so uh, they recently hacked a company called uh, HB Gary, I think it was. Oh, yes. Well, in that case, I would say it was justified by the vicious things that HB Gary was revealed to have done. But what do you think about the scale of attack? Because uh, HB Gary were doing research into Anonymous, and they wanted to uh, essentially sell data to the FBI, which is kind of what was reported. But what Anonymous did is they got into their systems, took all the data, made all the private data completely public. So yeah, well, in general, doing that to just anybody would be wrong. But doing that to H.B. Gary <laughs> was justified. So when it comes to the idea of an open free internet, so say everyone opens up their wireless access points, we run off like a distributed hash table of domains, domain names and things like that. At what point can we stop the more malicious government? You can't stop everything. There are different kinds of, of surveillance, different kinds of censorship. There are different tactics in the war on sharing. Uh, some of these can be blocked by the activities of the individuals separately or together, but some can't be stopped that way. For instance, the surveillance of car travel can't be stopped that way. Surveillance of your cell phone can be, some kinds can be stopped if you're running free software in it and not proprietary software. For instance, the eavesdropping mode. Uh, if you were using free software that was being maintained and checked by a bunch of hackers who wanted to protect people from surveillance, protect them from abuse through their cell phones, well, that would stop those kinds of abuse, but uh, it wouldn't stop them from tracking where you go because they can do that with triangulation from the towers. They don't need the cooperation of the cell phone. So, with a software and cell phones, what do you think about Google's Android software? And, well, Android is a step towards freedom. Google releases Android source code as free software. However, no phone is actually sold with just free software. There is a totally free version of Android called Replicant, which will run in an HTC Dream phone and makes it work as a phone. But it doesn't yet run in any newer kind of phone and the HTC Dream phone was made a few years ago and isn't made anymore. I guess you can buy some of them used. But this shows that we're at the beginning stages of making it possible to run phones with free software. So Google certainly, obviously, has contributed to this. Android is a contribution to this. But 
normally, if you get a phone with Android in it, it's not free software because it's locked down. Yeah, it's got spyware tools in it that Google used to track your data and things like that. Yeah, so the, and not only that, but it's not free software in that phone. You see, Freedom One, the freedom to study and change the source code to make the program do your computing as you wish, includes the freedom to use your version in place of the version that was originally given to you. And therefore, if the product doesn't allow you to install and really use your version, then that executable is not free. And that's the case with a, a lot of phones that have Android in them. I don't know the exact details, however. So at what, what point would you say that communications by a cell phone is completely free? Is it to the point where even the phone designs are given away? Well, actually, that's a different issue. Uh, we can't effectively change such hardware, so uh, there's no use demanding that the circuit diagrams be published and free, because suppose we wanted to change them, we couldn't anyway. So that's irrelevant. What's crucial is that all the software in them be free, because software we can change. So if they're stopping us from changing it, that's malice. The fact that we can't change a chip, that's not anybody's fault. That's not malice. That's just the way chips are. There's no use criticizing anybody for that. What, what else could they do? So, uh, so, the, so in fact, there is malicious hardware but we can't get rid of it by demanding the freedom to change hardware because it isn't feasible to change it. So the problem exists, but I have no solution to offer for it. The free software kind of solution doesn't adapt to the problem of malicious hardware. But aside from that, though, there's all the surveillance that's done in the phone system. And there may well be censorship in the phone network as well. And we can't solve the problems imposed on us by the network by changing the software in our own machines. And what about creating our own networks? Well, that, I don't know whether that's feasible. <sighs> there are people who do that locally. The problem is, how do you talk to somebody in another country that way? And so far, I don't see how any such solution is going to be made. Do you think it matters how free software is developed? Because Not for example, really. in, in Google, in Google Android specifically, they release a large amount of software under a free license. Um, well, they do these dumps every so often, and there's no way to look at how they're developing it. I don't see that as an ethical issue. But the amount that they release makes it very hard. I developed GNU Emacs that way, too. <laughs> that makes it harder to verify that you are doing something bad. Well, it means people have to, to compare the versions. But so, so, but so I don't think, though, that we can make any demands ethically about how people develop software. Um, would it be less secure to use free software in the banking sector? Oh no, it's more secure. Banks, banks do things that are terribly unsecure. If that freedom allowed access to security secrets, which could be... Banks, no, no, it's there, you've got it backwards. The so free software, typical free software, is probably a lot more secure than what banks are using now. From what I hear, they have systems that are proprietary and have terrible security. And uh, in fact, there is free software used in banks. In fact, I know someone who made free software for central banks, which is being, which is being used in central banks. London <coughs> It's not Linux. <laughs> it must be GNU plus Linux. 
I think you're confusing the openness of the algorithm used in a security method yeah. with the keys used to secure the data. Well, I was thinking if the secret is held in a way that makes it more secure than an open algorithm. No, it's backwards. For security, you must not trust algorithms or co you must not trust code which hasn't been studied by a lot of people. That's what security experts say. Security through obscurity doesn't work. The keys you keep secret. The algorithm you want checked by lots of people to reduce the chance that there's some hidden vulnerability in it. But is it not possible that developers' secrets are more, more <clears throat> secure? No, it's not possible. That's not what is observed, and that's not what security experts believe. They believe the exact opposite. That relies on the developer being perfect, and nobody's perfect. Well, no, it's... The development... Um, it, say a development has known weaknesses, um, but those weaknesses can't be exploited by a small bunch of developers. If um, this was opened up to a larger group, like the whole public, which would then allow those... They tend to leak out anyway. Uh, the way, you, the way you achieve security is not by that method. It seems reasonable to you, but experience says the opposite, and wisdom says the opposite. You might want to read what security experts say about this. To give you an analogy, on the front door of our house, you've got a leave, five lever lock. You can Go and buy one in the shop, take it apart, see how it works. You can look in a book or on the internet and see how that lock works. But it won't help you. But what I'm not going to do is show you the key that will open that lock. Also, if a small team of developers work together, uh, it relies on that team being together. If, if one of the developers gets a different job and works somewhere else, you have to completely change your security model because that developer no longer works for you and works for somebody else. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't think there's, no, I don't think there's anywhere. I was thinking large scale systems that can't be developed by um, individuals that could only be like the uh, security experts couldn't be developed. Well, GNU is a large system that wasn't developed by a few people. Microsoft Windows is another. GNU plus Linux is more secure. I'm, I'm just saying it's flagging up the security risk of opening up the development. It's not. It's just the opposite. Uh, is it my turn? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a a feature from Simon Singh's uh, book the, called The Code Book, which dates back to the First World War, a basic principle of cryptography. Dr. Stallman can probably tell me the, the originator of it. Um, rule one, assume that the enemy knows the algorithm. Uh, as our colleague here was saying, you can say that lock is a five lever lock or a seven lever lock, whatever it might be, but the actual combination is not going to be shown. And that's what's kept secret. Yeah, nowadays, people use design codes that use very long keys so that uh, uh, they couldn't be guessed the way uh, uh, the uh, code breakers of World War II guessed them. Uh, but there are a lot of encryption methods that look like they would be secure, but someone then discovers that really they're a lot weaker than they first seemed to be. And the way to avoid them is to have people study it. Of course, that's not perfect. There is no perfect uh, method known for that. But in general, uh, security experts will tell you security by obscurity 
can't be relied on. Uh, have you ever been attacked personally or maybe legally or something? Through? No, not me. Never. Well, actually once, uh, during the SCO lawsuit, SCO subpoenaed a lot of information from the Free Software Foundation and we got the subpoena quashed because it was unreasonable. They were asking us for information that the defendant, IBM, would have had, and uh, which was not really very related to the case anyway. So uh, our lawyer got the court, got the judge to void that subpoena, and so we never had to spend the time to hand over that data. Uh, I noticed some people are leaving. There are still stickers out there, and if anyone would like to buy some pins, buttons, and key rings from the FSF, they are still available. In fact, what time is it? It's pretty late. It's time to stop. So, happy hacking and thanks. If you want... <laughs>